Thank you very much. Uh, thank you to Andrew for this very warm welcome and for the invitation, as well as Andrew and your team. Well, today um, I will uh, talk a little bit on, on pediatric oncology. Uh, I have worked there for six years, and I want to use these examples and the ideas uh, which I gained there uh, to reflect a little bit on our um, research tradition and our research understanding. So, um, the first, um, Joanne already mentioned it, um, there is a regulatory um, framework in Austria, we have a law, and uh, my perspectives are those of an anthropologist, um, a music therapist, as well as a teacher and as a researcher. <coughs> so, um, since 2008, we have in Austria the federal or national law um, for music therapy, and it regulates on the one side that music therapy is an academic profession. And it needs to have an academic training. This was not so clear and not so easy in Europe. Um, let me come to this certain point that we say this is academic. And then we have a pledge of documentation with secrecy. Um, which is um, regulated by law, and there is one very special thing. It's written by law that this music therapy is based on therapeutic relationship. I'm not against the ideas of music medicine, because we cannot really separate. Uh, there are moments of where we use music as a medical tool, and most of the time we are using this as a therapeutic relationship. But when we do this, then I have some questions, or some questions arise in my mind. But to get a um, first impression of uh, the work, uh, I'll show you a video. It's a 15 years uh, old girl. Her name is Anna. She, is, uh, she came because since one month she had a cold. I could understand why she's not recovering. And she never left, left the hospital again. <coughs> because a very aggressive um, leukemia was diagnosed. So the video you will see this short uh, moment is in the first session. It was the second day after the diagnosis. She fell. She says, um, she had to get a warm on the solar plexus. It's not the brain. <laughs> and in this moment, you see uh, how tension she was during the music and then how she's coming down. Okay, so it's the first. So for me, the question is um, when we look at that video and when we examine uh, what's happening there, what are the criteria? What we are looking for? What should be the outcome? This is music therapy at the end of life. And when we, when we try to do research, what we are looking for? Also, during the process, each session was so different. So, how we can find some clear answers? So, if music therapy is based on a therapeutic relationship, that means that patients have to be recognized as subjects or partners. They are not objects which have to be treated on a therapeutic level. And if we do research, they are not objects of data collection. So how should we proceed? How we can take them um, into this process? Because if it's like this, this today's research, which is oriented on RCTs, that they asked for to reflect, do they reflect the practical bedside reality of the music therapist? And are the main question of uh, how music therapy works already answered? For instance, the question, is it the song or the singer? What gives the therapeutic impact? Are they actually answered? Because when you look at RCTs or when you look at the meta-analysis, always 
you find the sentence, more research has to be done. So my question is, which one? More of the same research has to be done? Are these questions answered so that we, we found the key and now just we have to make more and produce more and more RCTs and we get music therapy fixed? Or do I have an understanding of science as an evolving dynamic process? Because when we decided that RCTs are important, it was a cultural and social process of communities who decided to do so. So when it's a decision which is developed by a community, this community can develop it further, rethink um, and find other um, conclusions. So I'm, I'm not questioning the necessity of evidence-based research. Don't, please don't misunderstand me. But the question is where and when does it make sense and where do we need participatory approaches as in music therapy? Because if it's a relational, it's a <laughs> But if there is a relation, then it's not a one-way road. So we have to include the person. Then we have to include the patients. <coughs> and if so, shouldn't we not change the research and publication policy? I try to develop this. It's a little bit fast. I think what several times is um, misunderstood Thank you. is um, we are using methods but we don't think too much about methodologi uh, the methodological frame. In our case of music therapy I think it should be um, the participatory research and still we can do in the methods we can use the quantitative and qualitative stuff, the video data, this we can use but we have to bring it into a, a logical understanding. <coughs> Shortly explain the idea of participatory research. It comes up, or it came up, I could intervene <coughs> in the 30s, 40s, the last centuries. And she said it's a collaborative of nature. We are not doing, in the social, in the social sciences where I was, uh, where I, where I uh, studied a lot, we are not doing research on people and we are not doing research for people, but we are doing research, research with people. And if you one moment think about it, what it means, then you find three characteristics. <coughs> there is participation from the patient, there it's democratic, which of our research is democratic up to today, and uh, it contributes to social change and um, theories. That means we, are, we try to prove some of the theories. Did you ever ask the patient what is his or her theory? What should be his or her outcome? This is not question because there is a problem when you have a lot of single cases. And that's what we don't want, as I understood the community. So I have a problem with that um, uh, process at the moment. And if we look from the perspective of psychotherapy, thanks to the Heidelberg guys, I got this slide from, from Thomas uh, and from Julian, then I find it very interesting that um, in, when they ask what is important for the outcome, the client's experience on the therapeutic relationship makes 30% of the importance. 15% of the hope if the patient thinks or hopes to recover. This is 45% of the outcome. And we are doing the research on our 15% of techniques. This is something which I find really curious and amazing. So I'm asking, is the way of research we are doing the right one for music therapy and for the questions, for the basic questions in music therapy? I don't want to go back just to single case studies. It's not what I want. But I have the impression that we jumped when we found the, oh, we can do RCTs, we jumped into it 
but we have a lack of answers, basic answers yet. So the ethics in qualitative research, by the way, excuse my English is not the Oxford one and not the Cambridge one, it's Austrian one and I cannot really meet the details of English language, but I'm working on that. <laughs> Sorry. <about this. laughs> so whereas in traditional science the researcher is the center of power, qualitative research has relinquished one-way control in favor of sharing power. And this is the point I want to go. And understanding or undertaking a more dialogical and collaborative relationship with research participants <coughs> and their communities. So where is the semiotic therapy? It's got lost, I'm afraid. Of course, this stuff you need when you do research, but when, for instance, <laughs> this is also very strange. I'm not allowed to give to my clients at the moment, according to Australian law, the video data, which I do. It's crazy. Because we, in, in, in former times, we gave them the videos and they could take it home. And especially for Anna, it was that her, her family, she had some uh, nice remembrance. It's now forbidden. So this world is going a little crazy, I'm afraid. So, I ask some questions uh, and I try to, to go a step in, uh, in the direction of um, maybe find some solution. Maybe you have heard about action research already. Um, action research challenges traditional social science by moving beyond reflective knowledge created by outside experts. From this point of view, um, as a music therapist does research on music therapy, this is not real science because you cannot be objective because you have some ideas as music and some interests. So in the social science, we work on that, that we say, what are our interests and how we want to change the situation. All the knowledge is always gained through action and for action. So to step back and do as if we are not part of the game, uh, I think it doesn't really work. From the starting point, the question, the validity of social knowledge is to question not how to develop a reflective science about action, but how to develop genuinely well-informed <coughs> action. There is a French tradition we are working with. Uh, it's uh, from De Roche. He was a, a priest and a social scientist. And he changed action research to recherche action. He said, not only, um, or he, he went beyond, he said, any person who is doing research is doing research on herself or himself in the context he or she is working. working. So therapists is part of the game which has to be reflected. For, the, for instance, uh, since I have worked with Anna, my life changed. Because after this therapy session, when the, when the video was uh, turned off, she said, well, she was the best in her class. I think I should live more and work less. She was the best in her class. She was very polite, everything. But she didn't live her own life. Still, this remains in uh, my memory and to look at her until the last week of her life I uh, was at her bedside in the last week she didn't want any music therapy anymore she was too weak she had too much pain and she wanted just to stay with the family how can we do research and say that it does, has no impact on us when we undergo such experiences as therapists ourselves so what is more objective if I talk about these experiences and I open them to the community or I do as if there is nothing and I'm not part of this game? So what is the essence of music therapy? 
that's, that's the question. I, I know how to do research. But what is the essence of what we are doing? And do we get the essence by the way of research we are doing at the moment? Um, in the action research, I want to go to this. We are doing two things. You go, you go with the theory, with some experience into the field, then you make your uh, experiences, then you start to reflect them again, then um, you find new decisions, go in the field, and so on. This is a process, a never-ending process. But how do we bring it out of the subjective um, and emotional aspect to a more scientific? The one possibility is um, the video film. The other is that you have a discussion with peer groups, with patients, with the families. Because you're looking at the video, for instance, and discuss what happened. What do you see in this? So I show you a second uh, video with a little girl. She's 11 years at the time of the, of the take. And she had, um, she was in the isolation ward for two weeks. She was vomiting a lot. She was crying a lot. Um, and we decided uh, in the team that I go into this room without any. Has this? Yeah. Yeah. Just in normal clothes, uh, because she had some uh, psychological. She showed some psychological trauma. And let's have a look at the situation. She's um, showing her reality. It will, she's a survivor. She's still alive. Um, and we have a lot of videos with her. All that she's playing with this, with this beer. So um, what we are doing, to give you a, a, a more precise insight, is uh, we go to the reflection of the of the video. So there is a software which we are using. It's called Fit Party Tool. There you can uh, go into one second takes or less, and then you can uh, create categories. They you create yourself. Why? with the parents, with uh, colleagues, and whatever. So you are creating some <coughs> of um, these categories, like verbalization or phrasing or singing and eye contact and this, and then you put it into um, codes, color codes, and symbols, and then you get uh, this picture. It's like a partiture. That's why we call it very partiture. And um, for instance, in this video is um, one of the important moments uh, when on the musical um, moment I make a break longer than before and she's taking uh, the lead and then it's going on. So it's changed. At, at first she's reacting what I'm presenting and then she's taking the lead and I'm reacting to her. So, is this important or not? We don't know. But if you collect a lot of data like this, then you can see a structure of um, how we have an interaction with each other for this uh, patient. So, when we collect many of this data with many of the patients, you find some clusters and categories. Uh, <coughs> later on, yeah. I just wanted to say it was so interesting at the end how she took the gloves off the little yes. there. Which is almost like she felt really free with you, like uncovered by. Interesting. But this is something which we, we take up or we think uh, from an emotional point of view. This is to bring the rational perspective inside. Mm -hmm. so it could be this interpretation, but it could also be another thing. Exactly. So as a researcher, then I make the step back and say, what is it now, really? So. Yeah, you have it here, and you can see the eye contact and all this stuff. So what we find is the length of musical phrasing is important in this, in this situation. <coughs> and the patient needs his, in that case, her own time to respond. Uh, we have an increasing eye contact. 
here on the therapeutical session. Um, the musical phrasing should not be too long, otherwise she cannot react. Uh, because I can use music as a tool to avoid contact, or I can uh, use music as a tool to get in contact. Because when I, f I don't feel comfortable, what, I'm, what, what shall I do? I'm playing music. Because there I'm feel my, feeling myself comfortable, but then it's not therapy. That I'm <coughs> regulating myself, but not staying in contact with the patient. Do you understand what I mean? So you have one tool, music, and you can avoid contact and you can get into contact. <laughs> this is a very sensible. So and patients always need their own time to react. That's why I don't want to work <coughs> with pre-recorded music in general. Because again, out of the idea of staying in contact, and this is some uh, uh, how to stay in connection with it. So, we see music therapy, the aim can be, with the video analyzed, to reveal implicit connections, patterns and phenomena, which we did not understand yet while we are on the bedside. And to describe what actually happens between client and patient and the music therapist. We have our idea, what, which idea does the patient have? For instance, on a physiological level we found when, the pay, when, when we, we have the, the um, assumption that we are in close contact with the patient, we see on the psychophysiological level that the heart rate and the breeze uh, start to synchronize each other. This is another part of our research strategy which we have, but it's not uh, today's um, topic. To become aware of inter interactions taking place partly or fully outside of the therapist's awareness, because every one of us has blind spots. Mm. And to evaluate this subjective level of therapeutic encounter from the therapist side and the patient side, from the community. Um, I know the Heidelberg guys would say there are so many things, you anybody see another thing in one of these situations. But at least it may help to get a little bit more clear in what we are doing. <coughs> we can use the, this uh, software and this uh, program within different phases of research which we do and different purposes. For instance, it can we can do systematic analysis. Um, we can do an animation uh, <coughs> without any image because um, in times we have this is with <coughs> Protecting the rights of the patient, yeah. the rights of privacy. Yeah, the rights of privacy. Um, in, in times of this, sometimes we cannot, we, we are not allowed to show any video data, but we have so so much information. So I can take away the, the images and can work just with the particle, just with the items. Um, and I can uh, transcript or matrix for qualitative for data. So I think these are the main uh, ideas which I wanted to share with you. Um, we have uh, done it, or we have used this uh, transcription and have published it in, in a book. And the idea behind is um, this, which I very often think about uh, as a researcher, we must not end with our tradition, uh, let's say, or not tradition, but with our history. Um, somebody who experienced a very tough time who says we should not or we must not see any person as an abstraction. <coughs> but that's what we always uh, have to do in a, in a certain way as a researcher. And I want to, to um, bring awareness to this reality that when we are doing research, we are using very often patients as a source of data. So where is the where is the point 
um, where we lose being the idea of being a human. It's really since many, many years um, working in an ICU or working with uh, oncological patients. And for 16 years I have worked in the field of neurorehabilitation after brain injury. So this um, brought up these ideas. Okay, you can use this in the training for self-evaluation also. You can use it as an external evaluation. So we are working with these methods with our students as well as uh, in, the, in the research. We can enhance interdisciplinary teamwork. I remember very well when I started to uh, record the uh, therapy, therapy sessions when the doctors and the nurses laughed about that. Mm -hmm. And when we brought them the, the um, videos with the interaction, the patient interaction, therapist interaction, very often they were very surprised because they don't see this the patient in that, from that perspective. So that's why he or she 